Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Future Space. I'm your host, Daniel Fox. Our guest today is Joel Thurcell. Joel is a space technology pioneer and founder of TransAstra. Joel, welcome to the Future Space. Thank you so much. I'm just delighted to be here. It's our it's our take two together because we uh, we had a time uh, during the summer where I came over to your offices and then we sat down and we recorded an amazing conversation and we had an amazing bottle of wine to silver oak together. And then later on, I discovered that I had some uh, camera issues. So here we are doing it again. Let's do it. Excellent. Joel, before we go on into your work and we start to go deep into space philosophy, could you share with us three words that capture the essence of space for you? Everything, unlimited potential. And what would be the human story of going to space? There's a science story, there's a technology story, but beyond that, what is the human story of going to space? It's the ultimate frontier. It's the, it's the, the adventure that will go on forever. I mean, do you think that like beyond space, I mean, right now we're about to do that leap of exploration, like for the last, I would say 3.6 billion years, life has been building in complexity and expanding on earth within the tools and the capacity that it had, that it had. And now that leap that it's about to take will just open this new era where once we have we we figure out the way to move around and to to stay alive. Then it's just we're going to have billions of years of exploration expanding into the universe. Correct. So the human adventure in space is a continuation of the adventure of life on Earth. You know the way we look at it is that we're sitting on the precipice of a great leap that's beyond historic. You know. Big historical things, you know, you could say would be the signing of the Magna Carta, right? Or uh, the Bill of Rights, or, you know, you know, my view as an American, the American Revolution, right? But, but um, if you zoom out from space and look at the Earth from a million miles away, you have this small, you know, blue orb floating in the cosmos, and there have been a few things that have occurred on that blue, blue orb so far that have been significant. Um, it may be that life is plentiful in the universe, but so far we haven't found any evidence of other life in the universe. So a significant thing that happened billions of years ago on Earth was the emergence of life. Big deal. And uh, once it emerged, it covered the entire planet in terms of the, the, the ocean with simple one-celled organisms. And then it, it kind of got stagnated and it reached the limits of its frontier. Uh, but then a great innovation occurred. And that was the uh, spontaneous invention by natural selection of uh, eukaryotic life, complex life forms that could then evolve into ever more complex life forms. And, uh, and they spread throughout the ocean until they'd covered the entire ocean. Uh, and then at some point, the first animals walked on the planet, walked on the land. That's a very significant thing. And then they spread. And then, you know, depending on how you count it, uh, maybe a million years ago, maybe 100,000 years ago, maybe 30,000 years ago, intelligence emerged on the earth in the form of Homo sapien. And Homo sapiens spread to every major ecological niche on the land on the planet, from, from Arctic environments to sub-Saharan to tropical jungles, everything. And uh, at this point, you know, if you get into an airplane and fly across most of the continents of the Earth on a clear night when there's no cloud, there's city lights as far as the eye can see in every direction. So we filled, or we're nearing filling the capacity of the planet. But life has a way of innovating and inventing and getting to the next frontier. And, you know, we have, you know, as Carl Sagan referred to the planet, this pale blue dot floating in the cosmos. 
where life has been evolving, gave rise to intelligence that's observing the universe. And now for the first time, life is ready to launch its way into the cosmos. This is like, you know, I view this as like a, an aquatic animal that, or plant that spreads its seed and pollinates, and then it can then settle into other areas of the ocean. So far, we've been on this tiny little dot in this vast cosmos with resources that vastly outstrip the resources of the earth. And the human adventure is just beginning. And so it's an incredibly important and exciting time to be in the space business. You were talking about how this is like once in the species or even more so, because if we like we we take literally the comparison of when life went from single cell, as you were saying, to multi cell, it led to an explosion of evolution. And now we're about to go from life is about to go from single planet to multi planet which is the cell of the universe. Like a single planet is just a single cell in that universe. I mean, we look at the James Webb, the new uh, the recent images from the pillars of creation. And you just, you, you look at this image and you realize that every single pinhole dot contains thousands of other world. And so this is a giant organism. And now life is about to go from single cell. Yeah, I, I would say that life is, life is evolving from being planetary to being cosmic. Intelligent life harnesses tremendous quantities of energy and material and grows exponentially. And, you know, right now, humanity only harnesses about one ten thousandth of the solar energy that hits the surface of the Earth. If we are to be harnessing any significant fraction of the solar energy that hits the surface of the Earth, it would probably drive all other life on the Earth to extinction. So for intelligence, with this exponential potential, we shouldn't be on planets. We should be in the cosmos, building worlds out of the materials of the cosmos. What do I mean by that? There are billions of asteroids in our solar system. There's enough material in the asteroid belt there's enough material in the asteroid belt with those billions of asteroids to build a radiation shield 20 feet thick. That's a thousand times the surface area of the Earth. That means that we can build worlds like that artist concept up over my shoulder for humans and our progeny, whatever we evolve into, to live in terrestrial environments with a thousand times the carrying capacity of the earth. That's enough to support a population of a trillion people spread throughout the solar system. It doesn't make any sense to cram all those people onto planetary surfaces that might harbor, harbor life when we can live in free space, harnessing the, re the resources of the asteroid, Roy. And when we can live in free space, harnessing the resources of the asteroids and the energy of the sun, and so that's a very exciting potential. So it's not about being multi-planetary. Old-fashioned life forms are, pla are planetary. We're evolving into a new type of species, one that you might refer to as Homo sapiens cosmos. Homo sapiens cosmos can afford to process vastly greater quantities of energy without destroying a biosphere just harnessing rocks that are floating dead in space and have been doing so for billions of years. Uh, we can afford to harvest vast quantities of energy and material to exercise our minds and our industries to find out what we're really capable of as a species, to take the next leap of evolution, to take the next adventure of exploration and discovery. That's what life is all about. And I want to, you pointed the uh, mural behind you. And earlier you said about how we were going to pollinate into the cosmos. And the, you know, when I walked into your, your office, there's a, there's a bee right on the door and bees are really at the center of that narrative that you've created for the company. And the mural is all these, these little elements of, of the hives. Do you want to explain um, just the, the story behind and, and what it represents? 
Sure. So the Hive is our headquarters here in the city of San Fernando. And a year ago, it was an empty warehouse. Um, and now it's a place where we, we work every day in teamwork and fellowship to help build the future for humanity in space. Um, but we built this mural area in the Hive as a way to remind us what our mission is. And we're a vision-driven company. And it starts with the vision of humanity evolving and spreading in space, harnessing the resources of the asteroids for the betterment of our progeny and their progeny as far as the eye can see. And in order to do that, there's some core technologies that we need to invent, that we needed to invent. So we invented a core technology called our Sutter Telescope, which you can see behind me. Uh, the Sutter, the, um, the, Su the Sutter Ultra spacecraft, um, which is designed to prospect the asteroids. Um, you know, astronomers have found well in excess of 30,000 near Earth asteroids. But the vast majority of those asteroids are really hard to get to. They use uh, a lot of rocket. It would take a lot of rocket propellant to get there and back. So it'll be a very long time until harvesting those asteroids makes much economic sense. But we know from our statistical model that there are thousands of near-Earth asteroids that are actually easier to get to than the surface of the moon in terms of rocket propellant. And those are the ones that can make a lot of sense for harvesting resources. So we, we named the Sutter Telescope after Sutter's Mill, where gold was discovered in, Southern, in California. And that led to the gold rush of California, the settlement of the American West, the United States is an economic superpower. We see an analogy with asteroid resource harvesting. The Sutter Telescope, we're calculating we'll find thousands of low delta V, that means really easy to get to asteroids, that makes economic sense to go there to harvest their resources. So that's one of our core technologies. Another core technology that we're working on is our omnivore solar thermal rocket. What's really cool about the omnivore solar thermal rocket is one, it's an omnivore. It can work on virtually any rocket propellant. So if you go to any other aerospace company and you have them show you their rocket engine, it can only work on one propellant. You know, like a, uh, an electric propulsion system might work on argon or xenon propellant. Chemical rockets work on things that blow up. Um, uh, whereas the omnivore engine, wherever we go in space, we'll be able to harvest the propellant needed to power the omnivore and use that to refuel and move on. Um, so we invented the omnivore engine to enable asteroid harvesting because the asteroid mining vehicles that go to the asteroids can then live off, if you will, the land, live off the resources of space, harvest valuable resources, including the propellant they need to get to the next destination. Um, the other cool thing about the Omnivore engine is that it's powered by the sun. Now, there are other solar-powered rocket engines, rocket propulsion systems. They're called electric propulsion. They have really big, expensive, heavy solar arrays that convert the sunlight into electricity, and then that electricity powers the thruster. For most aerospace companies that build those systems, to get just one newton of thrust, that's about the weight of a small apple, would cost about $10 million in technology. So it's really expensive, and because they don't produce much thrust, they're slow. Whereas the omnivore engine just uses solar concentrators, solar reflectors, these really lightweight reflectors that we think we'll be able to make very inexpensively to just concentrate the sunlight onto the engine. We run the propellant through the engine. It gets superheated, squirted out to produce thrust. That's the omnivore propulsion system. Now, when we were thinking about that, we really don't want to be using a lot of electric power in space. Because electric power is expensive to generate from the sun, requires a lot of technologies to build solar cells and solar arrays and that sort of thing. But we power our propulsion systems by the sun, and we also power our mining vehicles by the sun. So we've invented and patented and proven a technology that we call optical mining, where we take highly concentrated sunlight. And if you go to our website at transaster.com, you can see videos of this process. The highly concentrated sunlight focuses on, focus onto a rock or asteroid material, can actually drill holes in that material. And um, in drilling those holes, it 
breaks off little pieces of the material that heat up. And when they heat up, they release their volatile contents. Volatile means a chemical word, means it's liquid at one temperature, gas at another. We can capture those volatiles, like water, carbon dioxide, methane, things like that. We can capture those and use them as rocket propellant. So the omnivore engine is designed to be powered by the sun and it's designed to use the chemical, the, the propellants that we can harvest from the asteroids. Um, and then we've invented a way that's depicted on our, our mural here where we can capture asteroids in bags, um, use optical mining to extract the valuable materials, and then use the omnivore propulsion system to bring that back. Now, these are all technologies that we invented to create this exciting future of people living and working in space. Initially dozens, then hundreds and thousands, then millions, and eventually more people in space than on the ground. And that's a little further down the road. But what's really cool about it is that we've been able to prove all those technologies and there are commercial applications of those technologies in the space industry today. So the Sutter telescope is tremendously valuable for monitoring debris and orbital traffic. And that's a real problem because space is getting crowded around the Earth. And there's debris. We, human, humans have left our trash behind in orbit already. We need to do better. Um, the difference is if you leave a tra piece of trash in a highway, it sits there until someone picks it up. In space, it's whizzing around at eight kilometers per second. And if it hits another piece of trash, it blows up into a whole bunch of little components. And any one of those little components, if they hit your spacecraft, can destroy your spacecraft. And if you're an astronaut, it can kill you. So this orbital debris problem in low Earth orbit is a real problem. And traffic monitoring to make sure spacecraft don't collide and make that happen is a very important issue. So with our Sutter telescope, we can help with that. We can help private sector companies avoid collisions with debris and other satellites. And we can help the government maintain awareness of what the traffic is to ensure safe operations. So that's a commercial application of that today. Likewise, we're projecting that over the next 10 years, about 100,000 satellites will be launched into low Earth orbit. Now, most of those satellites will be launched by rockets that are not very good at putting them in their final orbits where they need to go. So we've invented a vehicle that we call the Worker Bee that incorporates our omnivore propulsion system that can very inexpensively carry satellites and other payloads between orbits in space, sort of the last mile problem for space. That's a commercial application today. Likewise, our asteroid capture technology, which we invented to enable a more distant future of asteroid mining, in order to clean up orbital debris today, that same capture bag technology can be used now. So we're working with industrial partners and government partners on how to implement those things today. So we're really excited and we're having a, a ton of fun working very hard on all these technologies and bringing them into space. This is absolutely, I mean, did you always have that vision of the future and finally, technology kind of cut up and you found yourself in a fortunate place where the technology can answer your vision? Or, the, I mean, your visions and like evolved as the technology kind of allows you to imagine more and further and reach for the impossible? Well, uh, when I was a kid growing up in the Arizona desert back in the 1960s and 70s, you could go out into the desert at night and see the Milky Way galaxy and the planets. And with very little assistance to the unaided eye, you could see the moons of the, the giant planets and the rings of Saturn. And to me, as sort of a scientifically oriented kid, looking around in the clear night sky of the desert, camping with my father, hearing him tell me about, you know, that star out there could take 20 million years for the light from that star to hit your eyes. That planet you know, is only 40 light minutes from us. And the moon is only you know, on the order of a, a light second from us. And so I never really saw the separation between Earth and space. I sort of grew up with this idea that I live in space, but we're all trapped on this little dot. 
And it's, it always seemed obvious to me that we have to go there. Maybe part of it was also because my father was a, a jet pilot. So he'd strap into his supersonic jet and fly off into the night sky. And so I would see the, sometimes I would see the stars at night and the afterburner of his jet streaking across the sky. So it just like earth and sky were one to me from a very early age. So, um, uh, it never occurred to me that that wasn't the ultimate destination of humanity. I remember reading Sokovsky, who was a Russian school teacher, mathematician, around the turn of the century between the 19th and 20th century, who developed some of the basic mathematics of rocket propulsion and invented many of the basic concepts that we have in space exploration today. I remember when he read, when he, he I read a quote from him that said, the earth is the cradle of mankind, but you can't live in your cradle forever. That just looked, I remember reading that and I was going, well, of course, that's, that's obvious. Why would you even bother saying that? Um, and so uh, then I realized, well, of course I'm going to work in the space business. You know, as a little kid, I saw astronauts flying into space. I remember when I was a small child, the air conditioner was out. It was very hot that summer in Arizona. And we watched Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon. Later on, I got to meet both of them. Um, and um, so it just seemed obvious that that was what I would do. And so I went, to, I went to college, got a degree in engineering physics, went to work at NASA JPL, started working and contributing to that effort. And um, I'd been enamored by the concept of these space settlements that were originally conceived of and designed in a fair amount of engineering detail at a high level by this very famous and well-regarded physicist named Gerard K. O'Neill, Jerry O'Neill, as we called him. Um, and it always seemed obvious that making those out of asteroids was where we were going as a planet. Um, but in order to make that happen, we needed cheap transportation to and from space. So when I was in high school, NASA was developing the space shuttle. And this, they promised, and I remember I had this book that had all the things the space shuttle was going to do. It promised that the space shuttle would make space travel routine, affordable, and safe. And O'Neill took the numbers that NASA published on the cost and showed that if we could get the cost down to those numbers, it makes perfect economic sense to build settlements in space out of asteroids and lunar material. Um, the problem is the space shuttle didn't work. It worked as an engineering contraption. By the way, hats off to all the amazing engineers and scientists that made, at NASA that made and the aerospace contractors that made the space shuttle work because it was such an ungainly architecture that you had to superbly engineer it just to keep it from falling out of the sky every time it went into space. Um, and so it turns out it was a very dangerous system, very expensive. And the vision of space industrialization and space settlement never really came to bear. And so decades went by. And I remember working at JPL and JPL is proposing another billion dollar mission to go pick up rocks on a planet. And don't get me wrong, I think JPL missions are great, but uh, I didn't see the cost coming down. And while that's wonderful science, it doesn't really move the agenda forward of humanity moving into space. So I actually drifted into other things. I was teaching at Caltech. I was doing a lot of consulting for Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 50 companies, lecturing all over the world. But not I really kind of got out of the space business till a consulting client asked me to do a deep dive on SpaceX because they were thinking about buying SpaceX rockets. And I went and I got to meet many of the executives at SpaceX who were incredibly gracious. The amazing Gwen Shotwell has got to be the best executive I've ever met. Um, uh, and then uh, there's a guy named Hans there who was a tremendous engineer. And uh, there's and, and many others that I could name. But I, I got to work with them, uh, not shoulder to shoulder in a collaborative way, but really seeing how their engineering processes worked and how the rocket was designed and how the rocket worked. And I came away from it thinking, finally, Jerry O'Neill's vision is possible because we're going to have low cost reusable rockets. So I was able to help SpaceX get certified and make those arguments being paid 
by a customer that wanted to know the answer. And then as a result of that, I thought space is going to get exciting. And the vision that I and many others subscribe to, that humanity is going to become an exoplanetary species, a species of the cosmos, can happen now. And so that's why I founded Transastra, and we started working on all these technologies. I mean, it's amazing just the, the timing of it all, all these great minds, and then finally now you have the technology, and it kind of, you know, that was the last piece of the puzzle. And now all this brain power is being kind of no limits, whether you're talking to some people that are looking at uh, Mars, and they were telling me that the technology, the, the math and the technology right now exist to build a force field around Mars so that we can, you know, not have the cosmic rays strip the, the, the oxygen off the planet. I mean, the technology exists. And the most, I think, privilege that we have or, or benefit from the technology that we've created is that we can test and experiment without a human cost attached to it. Because I was watching, I was watching again, First Man on the, on the plane from DC And you're reminded. It's a great movie. Oh, it's absolutely. It really captures the anxiety and the complexity of the moment. All the silence and the character and what it needed to be. Um, but it's like today we have helicopters on Mars. We have rovers that have been collecting data. We have all these different um, machines in space that are satellites that are getting data, gathering data on Earth and space, the, the telescope. All that so that by the time we do make a leap, a, a step, and we find ourselves in those places, it won't be like blind and not knowing. And you won't have that, that element, that risk of putting the humans there to find out if it works or if it doesn't work, and in the process, losing lives. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's, it's, it's something that we forget, right? Yeah, robotic exploration is a very important thing in space. It's much more cost effective than human exploration with today's technology. But really the technology they're using for robotic exploration is 20th century technology with modern IT systems. Um, they're not really using modern aerospace approaches that can really get the cost down, but that will come also. I would love to see an exploration of the planet Mars with thousands of rovers roving all over the planet, going into caves, digging down to depths, really finding out, you know, the real question is, is there life on Mars? Was there life on Mars? What happened to Mars? Those are really important scientific questions to ask. And so, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Because it's, you read these stories of the extremes that the human species has gone to collect knowledge and to try to propel, you know, the next wave of exploration, whether it's these stories of like Antarctica or the Arctic, where they would go and build a little cabin and spend the winter in there and almost die at every time for what? So that they could just collect the weather. And now we have, we have satellites that just collect the weather as if like it was no tomorrow, like not even like it's, it's just a total different experience. Just recently, I just came back from the uh, from the Arctic, and I found myself visiting these runes from the Norse people 700 years ago. The the, the runes are nice. The only wow. thing left standing is the church, which is you know interesting because most of the runes usually it's these buildings that we build to express our faith in the in the conceptual, not in houses that you know for ourselves, but in these. A conceptual uh, beliefs that we have. But the thought that was going through my mind was 700 years in the past, these people were living their lives, you know, doing everything that they can to survive. This idea of the future in which I'm part of could not even be comprehensible. Like it would the, the, the just everything that is involved into having a ship that's anchored, not even anchor in front of their village, Because now the ship has the bow thrusters and these uh, these um, rudders that are independently from each other, and it's a GPS location. So 
It doesn't need anything. It's just stationary. Just even that, the fact that we have cell phones, walkie-talkies, the clothes, they wouldn't even, they wouldn't be in a position to, to make the dots. And there is 700 years from now, a future that exists that for us is totally unreachable. Like it, we're incapable of imagining what it will be. Um, and I think that's a humbling experience. I mean, do you, do you think it is? Yeah, I agree with, maybe it was Feynman who said that the universe is not only stranger than we can imagine, it's stranger than we can imagine. Um, however, within the limits of what we can easily imagine with available technology and science, we can have an incredibly exciting future. And whether that lasts 50 or 100 or 200 or 700 years, I don't know. Um, you know, we live at a time where 96% of the mass energy of the universe is locked up in dark matter and dark energy, and we have no idea what that is. So we don't have no idea what 96% of the universe is. We've been struggling along with the same theory of quantum mechanics and general relativity for well over 100 years without significant progress. It seems likely that there will be breakthroughs in physics that are beyond the imagination of anyone here today. And what that will open up in terms of possibilities is, is just purely anyone's guess. But within the known physics and engineering that we have, it's already mind bending. So as we move into space and slip the Shirley bonds of Earth and become cosmic species, we can integrate with artificial intelligence and genetic engineering and to become something vastly more than we are now. And the place to do it is space. So we're not messing with the biosphere while we're doing it. Um, a big, a big part of what we're about at Transastra is harvesting resources of space in a re responsible way that's sustainable into the indefinite future for the indefinite future ge of generations. Um, and so uh, we know that whatever it is will be beyond our imagination, but our imaginations take us to some pretty amazing places. Because the, the, when you and your team develop products for, you know, within space, the reality is the incentives to be sustainable, to be efficient, are a thousand times more important in space than they are on Earth. Because in fact, the incentive on Earth are to do the opposite, not to be effective because of the abundance, you know, or you can, you can throw your trash everywhere because, you know, you can, it doesn't really affect your life. But up in space, this is not a luxury that you have. You have to be sustainable. You have to be, you have to find ways to recycle and reuse that atom of transformed carbon that you have. You have to conserve the water. You have to create those closed loop environments that don't get worse with time, but actually get better, right? I would say yes and no. Yes, I agree that once we build space settlements, there are certain limit, there are certain materials that we'll have to marshal very carefully. We'll have to be very careful about conservation and reuse and that sort of thing. Uh, but the, the resources of space are vast. And I think we've already seen evidence that there'll be a ten temptation to treat it as a dumping ground. So I remember as recently as when I was a child, people would say it's okay to dump in the ocean because it's infinite. Like we know better now, right? You have to be careful what you dump in the ocean. And there's still countries on this planet, big, industrial, rapidly growing, dangerous companies. They happen to be... I said companies, I meant countries, but companies also. Countries that dump into the ocean and they dump into the atmosphere without consideration. They happen to be the same countries that don't respect human rights. Now, I'd like to think that you have to be so efficient in space that you reuse and recycle and don't leave trash behind. But the fact is we've already started to pollute space. The environment of low Earth orbit is already too crowded. And um, 
so now is the time to start thinking about these issues and putting in place the standards and approaches that ensure that we're responsible in our use of the space resource. Um, I had a discussion or a debate through the National Space Society with a space visionary and a wonderful, brilliant engineer by the name of um, Robert Zubrin, Bob Zubrin, uh, who has written a dozen or so books on why we should go to Mars and that sort of thing. And I was arguing that we need a balanced approach to space development and settlement because um, the incentive will not be to preserve the environment for future generations. And his, his attitude, you can see the video online if you look it up, is that's foolish. Let's say there's primitive microbes on Mars. Why do we want to protect them? That's unimportant. Um, we need to be human first. Where he and I agree is in putting humans first. Where we disagree is what that means. So for me, if there's a biosphere on Mars, even a primitive one, that's incredibly important scientifically and philosophically. And we don't want to repeat the mistakes of our ancestors that when they would go to a new world, net net would be a positive for humanity. But in the process, they did a lot of wrong. You know, species were wiped out by inadvertently introducing non-native predators. Um, civilizations were destroyed. Um, there won't be civilizations up there to destroy. But, but for me, the reason we need to preserve and protect the space environment is not out of some abstract principle of putting the environment before humans. It's about putting humans high on the list and respecting our progeny so that a hundred or a thousand years from now, our children, their children, their children will have the same opportunities that we have with the same wonderful resources of the solar system. So just like Native Americans, when they would hunt buffalo, would use the whole buffalo. At first, when we're harvesting asteroids, we won't have the technology and resources to use every bit of it. And we'll probably have to waste a fair amount of it. But as our technology gets better, um, and we start moving into space and settling in space, every resource in an asteroid that we harvest is going to be precious, either as radiation shielding or building material or for atmosphere or for chemical constituents to put into uh, food. So it, to me, it's all about balance. We have some people in the space community who are saying private enterprise should not be allowed in space, should be heavily regulated by governments. Well, if that happens, we will not settle space because it's only private enterprise that has the efficiency and the bold risk-taking attitude to make things happen. There are others who say there should be no regulation because it's an unlimited frontier. And uh, I think what we're arguing is that it should be somewhere in between. Yeah, I totally agree. And when you were saying, when you're talking about how currently the technology that we have and going mining asteroid, um, there will be a lot of waste. And then at one point we'll figure out better technology. And it, you know, reminded me of when I was on the ship recently, learning about whalers going for whale oil and, you know, for, for decades and a really, really long time, the only thing that they went after was the whale itself. They would discard the bones and then much until later did they realize that there was as much oil in the bones and then that, that totally changed. And then actually that allowed the industry to continue. But until then they were wasting all, and not because they, they wanted to, just because they, they didn't know until they knew. They didn't know any better. They didn't know any better. Joel, I want to be yeah, mindful. Makes perfect sense. I want to be mindful of your time. And for someone who has had an amazing career of pushing the boundaries and being able to create a team around yourself that can move with you and, and participate in that, what would be your words of wisdom? What are, what are Joel's words of wisdom? Words of I wouldn't claim to be a font of wisdom, but words of wisdom to who? Well, I mean, you obviously have been able to inspire and 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 bring a team together, and then you know you're the leader of that team, and somehow you must have these principles or these these vision. I mean, yeah, they're principles, 
that people resonate with and are able to, you know, to work with you? Well, remember why you're doing it. Have a mission. Be focused on a mission that's greater than yourself. Um, remember that it takes a team to get the job done. So you want to align yourself with people who share the same vision and mission and who like working together and can work together collaboratively. As an engineer or a scientist or a business person, it's very important to focus on first principles. And most people spend most of their time arguing by analogy um, rather than really digging into the first principles and asking why is that and getting right down to the bottom of it. Um, good ideas can come from anyone. So uh, I, one of my biggest kicks as a technical leader is being involved in a technical session, working with engineers. Someone comes up with a new idea to solve a problem that we've been beating our heads against. And it just sends a thrill of joy through me to hear wonderful new ideas. Embrace that which is new. Take smart risks. If you're looking at a decision, you're not quite sure whether to go A, B, or C is close or A or B. Then ask yourself, which one is more dangerous and scary? That's the one you take. Um, fortune favors the bold. Well, those, I mean, this is quite of an important wisdom. So I'm glad that you, that you shared it. Joe, it's always a pleasure to have a conversation with you. I love what you're working on. I love the fact that you painted a mural expressing the vision that you brought in arts. And, you know, it's not a, it's, it's not just a bunch of computers where the mission is written over there. It's, you know, on the wall is painted and it kind of creates that environment that constantly reminds people why they're there and why they're working. And I know I've met some of your team, they're young, they're dedicated, they're full of, of energy. So congratulations. And I'm looking forward for our next time together. Thank you so much, Daniel. This is a delight.